Welcome to the Resonance Guide to Acute Coronary Syndrome. Let's get right into it. Let's start with the basics. So there are three conditions that comprise acute coronary syndrome that includes unstable angina, end STEMI, and STEMI. So in terms of EKG changes for unstable angina and end STEMI, you may have no EKG changes or you may have ST depressions or T wave inversions. And obviously with STEMI, you're going to have ST elevations or a new left bundle branch block. The main thing that differentiates unstable angina from end STEMI is that unstable angina will have no troponin rise and end STEMI will have a troponin rise and STEMI of course will also have troponins. And in terms of the etiology for unstable angina, this is due to a ruptured coronary plaque or an acute thrombus, but there is no infarction. In contrast with an end STEMI, you have a ruptured plaque or thrombus, but there is a subendocardial infarct. And finally, with a STEMI, you have ruptured plaque or thrombus that leads to a transmural infarct. One thing to note is that unstable angina is becoming a less and less common diagnosis due to improvements in high sensitivity troponin, which are able to detect troponins at much lower levels than before. Uh, the other thing to know is that ST elevation is defined by a greater than one millimeter elevation in all leads except for which leads. And the answer to that is going to be in V2 and V3, which have a slightly higher threshold for calling it ST elevation. So in women, it needs to be greater than 1.5 millimeters. For men, it has to be greater than 2 millimeters if they're over the age of 40. And if they're young, under the age of 40, then it's greater than 2.5 millimeters. And again, for ST elevation, you need to see ST elevations in at least two contiguous leads. Finally, what is the name of criteria for identifying uh, MI if somebody has a new left bundle branch block? That's called the Scarbosa's criteria, and the ED is going to be using that a lot to stratify if somebody's having an MI or not. Now let's talk about the initial treatment of acute coronary syndrome, which is going to be the same across all three of these different conditions. So it really revolves around first antiplatelet, anticoagulation, plaque stabilization, and finally major adverse cardiac event prevention. For antiplatelets, it's really going to focus around dual antiplatelet therapy. And so that includes aspirin 325 milligram load plus ticagrelor 180 milligram load or clopidogrel 600 milligrams. And this is based on the trials, the CURE trial, the PLATO trial, and Triton Timmy 38. Unless you're suspicious of multivessel disease, then you can give aspirin alone because if the patient is potentially going to get a cabbage, then you don't want to give them dual antiplatelet because then they're going to have to wait five days before they can do the cabbage. One alternative if your facility has this is that you can use Cangrelor, which is a short-acting P2Y12 inhibitor, which has a quick on and quick off so they can turn it off and still do the cabbage. Okay, and then after this, you give aspirin 81 milligrams daily and then ticagrelor 90 milligrams twice a day. The difference between ticagrelor and clopidogrel is that ticagrelor is kind of the active drug already, whereas clopidogrel is a pro-drug. So ticagrelor actually has better outcomes compared to clopidogrel. But clopidogrel, also known as Plavix, is much cheaper, so a lot of patients are going to be on Plavix after discharge. Next step is anticoagulation, which is generally going to be with a heparin drip or Lovenox based on your uh, institution. And if you think it's going to be non-invasive management, then you can also consider Fondaparinux. For plaque stabilization, we're going to start all of these patients on a high-intensity statin per the Miracle and Prove-It trials. And then for major adverse cardiac events prevention, you're going to start them on low-dose metoprolol and uptitrate as necessary. And then you can also start lisinopril or captopril. One way that some people have learned it in the past is this acronym MONA-BASH, which stands for morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, aspirin, beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, statin, and heparin, which is still a nice framework to use if you need to, uh, but a couple of caveats to this. So nowadays, morphine is really only to be used if needed because there are some studies that have showed that morphine does worsen cardiovascular outcomes. And again, for oxygen, you only want to use it if they're truly hypoxic with an O2 sat less than 90% per the AVOID trial. Nitroglycerin, you do give. You can give it uh, sublingually every five minutes up to three times. If that's still not relieving their pain, then you can start a nitroglycerin trip. Key things to note are you want to avoid it in hypotension, bradycardia, or any phosphodiesterase inhibitor use in the last 24 to 48 hours, or right-sided MI because these patients are preload dependent. The part that I don't like about Monabash is that it just talks about aspirin, but it doesn't really touch upon dual antiplatelet therapy, which is kind of the standard of care nowadays. Moving on, let's talk about definitive treatment for unstable angina and end STEMI versus STEMI. Starting with STEMI, because it's a little more simple, the immediate thing you do with STEMI is you're going to do a cardiac catheterization unless it's contraindicated. And your goal is if you are at a PCI or stent 
capable facility, you want to get them to the stent uh, with a door to balloon time less than 90 minutes. If you're at a non-PCI capable facility, then you transfer to a PCI capable facility if you can get there within 120 minutes. Otherwise, there's this thing called the door to needle time, which is the time before you give them fibrinolytics, such as TPA, and that should be less than 30 minutes to the moment that they walk in the door. This would be contraindicated if they've been having symptoms for greater than 12 hours, in which case you would not do fibrinolysis. For unstable angina and NSTEMI, we have a completely different algorithm for how we decide to treat these patients. Really, we, what we do is a risk stratification with these things called the Timmy and Grace score. So the Timmy and Grace score are two scores that are used to determine is this person a high risk, medium risk, or low risk patient. Um, and the Timmy score is listed here. It con consists of these seven factors. And then the Grace score is a little bit more complicated. Uh, either way, I would just go on MD Calc and just calculate what their risk score is. Um, but based on their Timmy and Grace score and their risk stratification, you then choose between several different strategies. So you either go for an ischemia guided strategy, which is non-invasive, so they're not going to get a cardiac catheterization, or you go for a delayed invasive within 72 hours, an early invasive within 24 hours, or an immediate invasive strategy within two hours. So let's talk about how you choose between these different strategies. For ischemia guided, this is going to be people who are very low risk. So they have a low GRACE score of less than 109. They have a TIMI score of 0 to 1. Or you can consider low risk troponin negative females without high risk features. In this case, you put them on dual antiplatelet therapy. You try and medically manage them and see if their symptoms resolve. You can also stress test them, see if they actually have any perfusion defects. Uh, and then you can kind of manage it in that way. If they fail medical therapy or they have dynamic EKG changes or myocardial perfusion defects on their stress test, then you go to cardiac catheterization for definitive treatment. For a medium risk patient, this is with a GRACE score of 109 to 140 or a TIMI score greater than or equal to 2 or these uh, other risk factors listed here, you can choose a delayed invasive strategy where you're going to go for a cardiac catheterization within 72 hours. And finally, candidates for an early invasive strategy are going to be slightly higher risk patients with GRACE scores greater than 140, a temporal change in their troponins or new ST depressions, and they're going to be going for an early invasive strategy within 24 hours. What are the indications for an immediate invasive strategy? This is going to be something that the attendings are going to pimp you on. Um, so if the patient is having refractory angina, so for example, you put them on nitroglycerin, they do those three sublingual things, and then you put them on a nitro drip and they're still having angina, this is, a, this is an indication for an immediate invasive strategy. And you should call the cardiology fellow to see if they can activate the cath lab and undergo PCI. Next is if they have heart failure or new or worsening mitral regurgitation, if they have any hemodynamic instability, if they have recurrent angina at rest despite medical therapy or sustained VT or VF. So any of these would be indications to go for an immediate invasive strategy within two hours. So let's talk about to cath or not to cath. Okay, this is going to be a big question and I've already been talking about cardiac catheterization and I just wanted to do a brief overview just so you know, when I started intern year, I didn't totally understand what the whole point of cathing somebody was. So basically, when you do a cardiac cath, you take a catheter through the femoral artery or through the radial artery, you bring it all the way up to the coronary arteries in the heart, and then you shoot dye. And with that dye, you can check the blood flow and see how good the patient's blood flow is, and if they have any areas of stenosis or lesions that need to be intervened on. In this case, we have a coronary angiogram showing a severe narrowing, and I believe this is in the proximal LAD. So here you have the whole left anterior descending artery. I believe this is the diagonal branch, and then here's the left circumflex branch. And the question at this point is, what are you gonna do about this lesion that's here? So you have two options. The first one is stenting, also known as pure cutaneous coronary intervention. And so basically what you do is you find this lesion and you place a stent there to restore the blood flow. You open up that blocked blood vessel and then you basically save the day. Okay, with cabbage, this is coronary artery bypass graft. You're going to take a vessel from somewhere else in the patient's body, say the saphenous vein or the internal thoracic mammary artery, and you're going to bypass that blockage. What are the indications for cabbage versus stent? Um, this is something you definitely should know. And this is if they have left main coronary artery disease, which I'll go over what that is. If they have three vessel disease, or if they have two vessel disease that includes the left anterior descending artery plus LV dysfunction. These are some of the indications for going for a cabbage rather than for a stent. 
So in terms of what is left main disease, so here is a picture of the heart, okay? You have the left anterior descending, you have the diagonal branch and the left circumflex artery. And then right here, this would be the left main coronary artery. What is an EKG finding of left main disease? So here is a patient with left main disease, left main coronary artery disease. And the EKG finding that you're looking for here is ST elevations in lead AVR. And if you see that, that's pretty specific for a lesion in the left main coronary artery. And this, process, this person's probably going to need to go for cabbage. Now, going back to stenting, let's talk about if they do end up getting a stent, what are some of the early and late complications of placing a stent? This is something that uh, you will definitely be asked by your attendings and you need to know this. So an early complication of a stent is called instant thrombosis. So you place the stent and all of a sudden you get a blood clot in that stent that's blocking it off again. That's going to be an early complication. Late complications, say six months from now, nine months or years from now, the complication you're going to get is instant restenosis. And this is very important to know. So what is the main reason that we use dual antiplatelet therapy after PCI? The, me the main reason we do that is to prevent instant thrombosis. I'm going to just show a few more pictures just to really nail home this point because it's very important to know the difference between instant restenosis and instant thrombosis. So for instant thrombosis, this is the early complication. You're going to get an acute blood clot in the new stent. And then for restenosis, this is going to be kind of hyperplasia of this art artery wall right here that slowly occurs over time and decreases the blood flow. So, and then here you can see thrombosis in general leads to a relatively higher chance of death compared to restenosis. Here is another graphic talking about stent thrombosis and instant restenosis. So for stent thrombosis, uh, this is often caused by lack of antiplatelet therapy and typically occurs acutely and presents as ACS. The way we prevent it, it was, is with dual antiplatelet therapy. For instant restenosis, this is caused by neo-intimal hyperplasia, occurs over a longer period of time. Usually it's going to present a little bit more insidiously, like with angina that's slowly getting worse over time. And this is prevented by chemotherapeutic drugs coating on the stent itself. Let's talk about the two different types of stents that are available. You have bare metal stents and drug-eluting stents. And in terms of which one we're usually going to be using, um, we have these two options. So bare metal stent has really fallen out of favor. Um, it has very high rates of instant restenosis. The one advantage of it is it only requires one month of dual antiplatelet therapy because it has a slightly lower risk of instant thrombosis. The drug eluding stent, however, is really our favored uh, stent at this point. It uses a bunch of chemo drugs to prevent that neo-intimal hyperplasia and prevent restenosis. It overall has better outcomes but it does have higher rates of instant thrombosis and requires one year of dual antiplatelet therapy. There are better drug eluting stents that are coming out and sometimes you can get away with six months or something like that if patients are especially high uh, bleeding risk. But in general, patients should be on one year of dual antiplatelet therapy, after which they should switch to monotherapy either with aspirin alone, Plavix alone, or Ticagrelor alone. So what happens if your patient does not take their dual antiplatelet therapy? Say that they get a new stent and then they decide, you know, they end up being non-adherent and they're not taking any dual antiplatelet therapy. Well, they're going to get instant thrombosis. And I put it here, they die. Um, so that's kind of exaggerating things. But really, they're going to get a really bad MI and it's going to potentially be fatal. Um, so it's really dangerous to give a stent to somebody if they're not going to take their dual antiplatelet therapy or if they're going to be limited by how much dual antiplatelet they can take because they're bleeding or they have anemia or low platelets or something like that. So this is all things that need to go into the decision of whether to cath or not to cath. So some of the contraindications for doing a cardiac catheterization and potential stent is if somebody has poor follow-up or poor adherence to medications, or if they really can't tolerate dual antiplatelet therapy, they have a high bleeding risk, they have severe anemia, these are relative contraindications to doing a PCI because eventually they're going to get pulled off their DAPT and they're not going to be taking it and they're going to get another thrombosis in their stent and they're going to have an even worse MI. For some examples of this, um, trauma patient with acute blood loss, multiple recent surgeries having an MI, no cath because they're having acute blood loss. You're not going to put this person on dual antiplatelet therapy even if they get a stent. So uh, if you did place a stent, they're not going to get dual antiplatelet. They're going to have another thrombosis and it's going to be a worse MI. Cancer patient with pancytopenia, again, somebody you're not going to be able to easily put on dual antiplatelet therapy. So no cath. 
And then a patient struggling with IV drug use, homelessness, poor medication adherence. Another reason that you would probably lean against doing a cath and PCI because they're going to get a worse MI after placing a PCI. Here's a little um, graphic that I took from Kern in 2011. And so here are some relative contraindications for getting uh, for doing a cath. So acute GI bleeding or anemia, anticoagulation or uncontrolled bleeding, diathesis, um, and then also uncooperative patient, non-inherent to medications. These are some of the major reasons that you might avoid placing a stent in somebody. So let's go back to the big picture. We already covered ACS and type 1 MI, and let's quickly go over the therapy and management for them again. So with all of these conditions, your initial treatment is going to be dual antiplatelet therapy, anticoagulation with heparin or Lovenox, and atorvastatin for plaque stabilization. With STEMI, you're going to go most of the time for cath. And with unstable angina and NSTEMI, you're going to use the TIMI or GRACE score to do risk stratification to figure out whether you're going to do an ischemia-guided strategy versus an invasive strategy. And for all of these conditions, you would avoid catheterization if it's contraindicated. Next, we have these three conditions over here on the left. We have atypical chest pain, we have non-MI troponin elevation, and we have type 2 MI. And for all of these, for uh, non-MI troponin elevation and type 2 MI, there is no indication for dual antiplatelet therapy, no indication for anticoagulation, and no indication for cardiac catheterization. And this is an important point to know. Let's talk about some of the differences between all of these conditions, starting with type 2 MI. There's actually five different types of MI. So in all of these, you know, NSTEMI and STEMI, those are type 1 MIs. And then we have type 2 MI. Okay, so type 1 is a, an acute coronary thrombosis or plaque rupture slash erosion. Type 2 is going to be your supply and demand mismatch. And one thing I'd like to know is a lot of people say type 2 NSTEMI, uh, but these days the terminology is favoring calling it type 2 MI because calling it type 2 NSTEMI is kind of confusing and some people may get it confused for a type 1 MI because you're calling it an NSTEMI. Type 3 is when MI presents as sudden cardiac death. And then you have type 4, which is going to be due to PCI. So 4A is uh, just kind of acutely after the PCI was placed. And 4B is instant thrombosis. And 4C is instant resinosis. And then finally, type 5 is going to be an MI that's related to a coronary artery bypass graft. So bringing back that table that we were doing earlier with uh, our unstable angina and STEMI and STEMI filled out, let's see how type 2 MI stands out in here. So are we going to see EKG changes with type 2 MI? Well, it's going to be the same as unstable angina and NSTEMI. You may see EKG changes or you may not, but they are having an infarction, so they definitely could have EKG changes. In terms of troponins, are you going to see troponins? Well, yes, they are having an MI. They are having an infarction, so you are going to see troponins. And in terms of the etiology, this is going to be the supply-demand mismatch, and they could have underlying CAD or not, but the cause of their MI is not due to their CAD. Okay, so they're not having a plaque rupture, they're not having acute coronary thrombosis, anything like that. They're having some other underlying etiology that's causing them to have this infarction. And so the treatment is really aimed at treating the underlying condition. Again, no role for dual antiplatelet therapy, anticoagulation, or catheterization. Now I want to talk about non-MI troponin elevation. So this one is going to be a scenario where you do not have infarction. So in terms of EKG changes, you're going to have no EKG changes. Troponins, you do have mild troponin elevations. So you will have troponins, they will be positive, but it's non-dynamic. And you'll see that in all of these other areas here, I added that you'll have a dynamic rise in troponins. So for example, it's 25, then it's 200, and then it's 1,000. Okay, this one will be more like 25 to 30 to like 28. In terms of the etiology, a lot of times this is going to be poor clearance of troponin enzyme. A lot of times we see this in patients with kidney dysfunction, ESRD, CKD, um, or advanced age. And the treatment is none. You don't do anything about this non-MI troponin uh, elevation. This is chronic myocardial injury that does not warrant any invasive intervention. So again, the same as before. I also want to talk about some other uh, terms that you might hear about this because the terminology can be very confusing, uh, but it's also known as chronic myocardial injury, myocardial injury without infarction, or non-ischemic myocardial injury. All of these are proper ICD codes that can be basically billed to the same thing. 
And uh, again, most commonly due to CKD, but there's a whole list of other things that can cause a non-MI troponin elevation. Okay, and to reiterate, what is the difference between non-MI troponin elevation and type 2 MI? So with a non-MI troponin elevation, you do not have infarction, you do not have EKG changes, and there is no dynamic troponin rise. For type 2 MI, you do have infarction, you have plus or minus EKG changes, and yes, you do have a dynamic troponin rise. Now let's talk about atypical chest pain. This is a very kind of vague diagnosis, but it's kind of uh, when you're not really totally sure what's going on, then you can kind of just put a diagnosis of atypical chest pain. And first of all, to diagnose atypical chest pain, you have to know what typical chest pain is. So what is typical chest pain? There's three criteria for this. The three criteria are dull substernal chest pain that is worsened with exertion and relieved with rest or nitroglycerin. If your patient meets three out of three of these criteria, that's called typical chest pain. If they meet two out of three of this, it's called atypical chest pain. And if they meet zero or one out of three of these criteria, it's called non-cardiac chest pain. This is just one random question that I wanted to add on here, but what finding on your history or physical exam actually has the highest likelihood ratio for diagnosing MI? And that is actually going to be pain that radiates to the right arm or shoulder actually has a positive likelihood ratio of 4.7, which means it basically increases your post-test probability of them having an MI by about 30%. Um, you know, typically we have the association with ra radiation down the left arm, and that definitely is more common. But if they're describing pain that radiates to the right arm, that's actually more specific than uh, pain radiating, radiating down the left arm. Next, I want to talk about chest pain that does not present typically. There are many patient populations in which chest pain may present atypically, and some of those populations may include elderly patients, female patients, and diabetic patients. And in these populations, they may instead present with shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, malaise, and other very nonspecific symptoms. So for these patients, you have to have a higher index of suspicion that they could be having some kind of ACS event, even if they're not presenting typically. So what are some risk factors that should incline you more towards stress testing to figure out if they're actually having some kind of lesion that's causing a perfusion defect? So these are going to be type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, smoking, obesity, CKD age greater than 45 in men or greater than 55 in women, and then a family history of premature MI, which is defined as age less than 55 in men and age less than 65 in women. And that's an important definition to know because that's going to be your definition of uh, premature history of MI in the family. So going back to our large table at this point, atypical chest pain. So for EKG changes, I'm going to say, no, you generally are not going to have EKG changes with uh, atypical chest pain, uh, but you definitely could. Troponins are generally gonna be negative. If the troponins are positive, you're kind of more in this end STEMI territory at that point. Uh, and the etiology is unclear. So it's ischemic versus non-ischemic and further testing is required. The treatment for this is going to be um, basically based on if you think they're low risk, medium risk, or high risk. So low risk is going to be no treatment. It's just going to be risk factor modification. So stop smoking, eat a better diet, control their diabetes, control their hypertension. If they're medium risk, this is really going to be the population that you're going to want to do a stress test on to figure out if you can rule out um, coronary artery disease or rule in, rule in coronary artery disease. And finally, if they're extremely high risk, you know, if you, you're just going to go straight to cath at that point and basically treat it as unstable angina with high risk factors. Because imagine if they're high risk, they have tons of risk factors, they're giving you this uh, nonspecific history, but you're kind of concerned. If you get a stress test and it's negative, you're still going to be concerned, right? So you might as well just go straight for the invasive approach and really get that definite treatment and intervention going. Let's talk briefly about stress testing because this is a major topic that you're going to need to know when you're uh, sending patients for stress tests. So the conditions in which you may decide to stress test a patient are really going to be your atypical chest pain, unstable angina, and end STEMI. Um, but not even, you know, pretty rare for end STEMI, but sometimes you, you may do this. Uh, but really it's going to be risk stratifying these patients in these subgroups. For non-ST elevation ACS, again, this is going to be when your Timmy Gray score is low and you're planning for an ischemia-guided strategy. And, uh, and the next question I wanted to ask is, what's the difference between atypical chest pain and unstable angina? 
Well, it really just comes down to the history and whether or not you think this is an ACS event. So high risk atypical chest pain basically means you're going to be treating it as unstable angina with a high Timmy slash Grace score. So you'll go straight to cat. There's two types of stress testing. There's functional tests and anatomical tests. So functional tests are uh, basically things that are actually going to look at how your heart is performing when it's under stress, whereas anatomical tests are just going to look for if there's a lesion. They can't tell you if it's actually significant, but uh, you'll actually be able to see if a lesion is present. Um, so functional tests include exercise EKGs, stress echocardiogram, nuclear tests, and anatomical tests are going to include coronary CT angiogram or cardiac catheterization. So in terms of this table, um, we have kind of two pillars of stress testing. You can do exercise testing or you can do pharmacologic testing. And this is really the choice of this is really going to depend on if your patient can exercise or not or if they can't exercise. And uh, the first test that we're going to talk about is the treadmill. So if somebody says treadmill, then they're talking about an EKG treadmill test. This one only has about a 70% sensitivity. Um, it's not really as specific as the other ones, but it's definitely the cheapest and easiest one to do. Um, so contraindications for doing this, obviously, if they can't walk, if they have baseline left bundle branch block or their paste, um, or if they have ST changes or LVH strain at baseline, then you're not going to do an EKG stress test because you're not going to be able to tell if they're having uh, EKG changes. The next test that you can do is an exercise stress echo. And this one's a lot better than the exercise uh, EKG. Basically, you're going to take an echo and then you're going to have them walk on a treadmill until they reach a certain degree of stress. And then they are going to undergo uh, a repeat echo to look for any wall motion abnormalities. Contraindications for this are going to be pre-existing wall motion abnormalities, bundle branch block, or low EF. Uh, but some of the advantages of this are that it has higher sensitivity compared to the EKG stress test, and it also will tell you the territory of where their wall motion abnormalities are. And then there's no nuclear exercise test, so we'll just skip that for now. Pharmacologic, uh, this is when you're going to give a medication uh, to stress the heart or to vasodilate the arteries in order to check if there's any perfusion defects after you do a stress like that. Um, there is no EKG pharmacologic stress test. For uh, stress echo, that's pharmacologic, we do what's called a dobutamine stress echo. So dobutamine is a beta agonist. It's going to cause them to become tachycardic, and that's going to cause stress on the heart. And at that point, you're going to check for any wall motion abnormalities. A contraindication for this is a recent MI. And then finally, one that we do very commonly in the hospital, because a lot of these patients are older and they can't walk, is to do a PET myocardial perfusion test. And we use agents such as regadenosan or rubidium. These are coronary vasodilators. So when you dilate all of the coronary vasculature, it's going to basically cause a relative lack of blood flow to the stenotic lesion. Um, normally, you have dilation of just that vessel um, to help it get better blood flow. But once you dilate everything diffusely, it's not going to get that extra advantage of having good blood flow there. Um, so then you're going to get the perfusion defect uh, when you do that. Contraindications to this uh, include hypotension or reactive airway disease such as asthma, COPD, or wheezing. And then finally, another option that doesn't really fit on uh, this table here is CT coronary angiogram. This is going to be kind of the fastest and easiest way that you can do an anatomic exam to see if somebody has a significant uh, coronary artery disease or calcium lesions in their uh, coronary arteries. It's good to use if you have a younger patient who has baseline bradycardia. Um, basically, it's capturing a bunch of images. So if they're tachycardic, it's going to just be all fuzzy and difficult to read. But if they have a low heart rate at baseline, it's going to be much more clear and have a higher resolution. Uh, you can't use this if the patient has prior stents because it's just going to create a bunch of artifacts. So that's something definitely to consider. And then finally, I have a brief uh, overview of the exercise treadmill test Duke score. This is basically how you determine if an EKG treadmill test is positive or not. So the higher the number they are, the lower the risk is. And then if their score is negative 10 to negative 4, they're intermediate risk. And they're high risk if they're less than negative 10. And it has this equation for how to calculate it. One more thing that you should know in terms of a doing a PET-Myo is that A, the patient should be NPO. 
And uh, also, you're frequently going to have to be asked, like, what meds should be held. And so medications that could affect the test and need to be held beforehand are nitrates and caffeine. So make sure the patient does not have any nitrates or caffeine before their test. Um, and beta blockers are actually okay. You don't have to hold their beta blockers. And this is something that's going to come up often. So make sure you know which medications need to be held beforehand. In summary, I just want to do a brief overview of everything we covered so far. So we started off talking about ACS and the different conditions that are within ACS and how to differentiate between them. And then we also talked about the initial treatment, which revolves around antiplatelet, anticoagulation, plaque stabilization, and MACE prevention. In terms of unstable angina and end STEMI and the approach to treating STEMI, well, STEMI is obviously you're going to start with the cath as soon as possible, and you're going to try and get that door to balloon time of less than 90 minutes or less than 120 minutes if you're at a non-PCI capable facility. And with unstable angina and end STEMI, you're going to rely on the TIMI and GRAY score to do a risk stratification, and then you're going to choose between an ischemia guided uh, approach or a delayed invasive, early invasive, or immediate invasive approach. Again, we covered what are the criteria for choosing which kind of approach you're going to take. And really, you're going to be using the Grace and Timmy scores to kind of determine this. Then we talked briefly about the two interventions that you're going to be considering. If somebody does have a lesion, you're going to be doing stent or versus cabbage. And we talked about the uh, different indications for doing a cabbage rather than stent. And we also talked about when you wouldn't want to stent somebody, for example, if they have poor follow-up, poor adherence to medications, or who's somebody who's not going to be able to tolerate dual antiplatelet therapy. Finally, we, we did a further overview of uh, some other common conditions that will present with troponin elevations or kind of concerning chest pain and how you can differentiate those from ACS, uh, especially type 2 MI, which is going to be a myocardial infarction, but it's due to supply demand mismatch and not from an ACS event. Uh, and then non-MI troponin elevation, which we see all the time, and you're going to see basically a mild uh, troponin elevation, which is not related to a myocardial infarction. And then atypical chest pain, which is going to be this vague chest pain that you're going to determine is are they low risk, in which case you're not going to do anything, because if you stress test them, you might cause a false positive. Or if they're medium risk, you're going to do a stress test. And if they're high risk, then you're just going to go immediate for uh, invasive intervention and diagnosis. We talked briefly about the different types of stress tests that are available, and I'd say uh, exercise treadmill test is definitely your cheapest but kind of least sensitive one. you got exercise stress echo, which is a great option. You've got your pet myocardium, which is what uh, I see most frequently at my institution. And you can also consider CT coronary angiogram if you want to get a really rapid assessment, uh, but only uh, in select patient populations. Finally, I just want to tell you about some more reading that you should do. I highly, highly recommend you read the 2014 AHA ACC guidelines for NSTEMI, which I think was the most useful piece of reading in preparation for cardiology. Uh, you can also read the 2013 guidelines for STEMI, and then I would just try and read every up-to-date article on ACS that you can, because the more repetitions you get, the better you're going to understand this whole complex topic. So finally, I just want to do a couple of examples um, to just kind of practice. Now, I will say that I'm only a second year internal medicine resident, and I have gone through some of these with some cardiology fellows, uh, but some of these may not be correct. And if there are any corrections that I have to make later, uh, either with the, these examples or earlier in the presentation, uh, I will put all corrections into the YouTube description below. So keep an eye out for those to see if there's any corrections or updates down there. So let's talk about many different patient scenarios that you may come across and let's talk about what their diagnosis is and if they should undergo cardiac catheterization. So the first scenario you're going to talk about is a 63-year-old woman with type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, presenting with exertional chest pain that's located diffusely across her chest, it's relieved with rest, and she has tenderness to palpation of her chest wall. She does have a normal EKG and troponin. Okay, the way that I look at this is the patient definitely has risk factors for coronary artery disease. It is exertional chest pain, which is one of the three criteria, and it's relieved with rest. So she's got two out of three criteria uh, for chest pain, and that basically gives a, a diagnosis of atypical chest pain. Uh, there are some atypical features. For example, it's diffuse across her chest, and it's uh, tender to palpation of her chest wall, which suggests some kind of musculoskeletal etiology like costochondritis or, or, something, or some kind of muscle strain rather than uh, a cardiac etiology. 
So the diagnosis here is going to be atypical chest pain. In terms of cardiac catheterization, we don't think she's super high risk. Now, if she had end-stage renal disease and a huge smoking history, then we may just go for uh, cardiac catheterization. But in her, she's kind of like a moderate risk. She definitely has some uh, risk factors. So for her, we're not going to do a cardiac catheterization, but we'll probably lean towards going for a stress test to see if she has any perfusion defects. All right, the next patient scenario is a 39-year-old man with hypertension who presented earlier today with substernal exertional chest pain that's relieved with rest. Okay, so right there, we got all three of the um, criteria for typical chest pain. He says his chest pain is now resolved. He had a normal EKG and troponins were mildly positive and now downtrending. So this patient is very young. They don't have that many risk factors for coronary artery disease, but they do have a very concerning story and they also have tr positive troponins, right? So in this case, if we think this is an ACS event, then he would meet criteria for type 1 end STEMI because he has positive troponins. I would not consider this non-MI troponin elevation because his story is very concerning for possible ACS. And uh, I would also not consider this type 2 MI because he doesn't have any underlying other condition like septic shock or hypotension or, or something like that that could explain why his troponins are elevated. So for him, this is going to be a diagnosis of type 1 end STEMI. Now with him, he has a very low Timmy score. It's only one and he doesn't have a super concerning story. Uh, but because he's got positive troponins, this patient probably would go for a delayed invasive strategy for cardiac catheterization. I've seen similar patients to this, and it kind of is um, attending preference because now his chest pain's resolved, his troponins are downtrending. Um, some some attendings may actually go for an ischemia guided uh, intervention or maybe do a stress test outpatient uh, for this. Because if you look here, um, you can see that this patient, you know, he fits Timmy a score of one. Uh, but, you know, he's troponin positive. He's not a low risk troponin negative female. So that kind of leads him more down this delayed invasive strategy. Uh, but again, he's kind of borderline where some attendings may actually favor just like outpatient stress tests or a stress test before discharge. Next, we have a 67 year old man with chronic kidney disease, hypertension and presenting to the ED after stubbing his toe really badly. He has a normal EKG and his troponins are mildly positive, okay? A lot of times in the ED, they get troponins. Um, you know, it's something that they need to get to kind of make sure they don't miss anything. Uh, but in this case, there's no, you know, real reason that they got it other than the guy presented to the ED. Uh, it's mildly positive. He's got chronic kidney disease. So this is going to be a non-MI troponin elevation. Are they going to get a cardiac cath? The answer is simple. They are not going to get a cardiac cath. 52-year-old man with type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, family history of premature MI. Again, this is going to be a, a first-degree relative that's uh, less than 55 if they're male or less than 65 if they're female. With worsening substernal exertional chest pain that's relieved with rest. So it's got three out of three of the criteria for typical chest pain and it's worsening. They have ST depressions on EKG and they have negative troponins, okay? So three out of three criteria, got a concerning story, got concerning risk factors. This is probably ACS. They do not have troponin elevation. So automatically, you know that this is unstable angina. And in terms of, are you going to cath this person? This person really does have quite a few risk factors. Um, so I would say probably an early invasive strategy uh, within 24 hours is indicated for this patient. Next is a 74 year old man with known coronary artery disease, type two diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and BPH, who's coming in with septic shock from UTI. They are found to have EKG with ST depressions in the lateral leads, and they have positive troponins with a dynamic rise. For example, started off at 100, and then it's 500, and then it's like 1200. So this is going to be somebody who actually has a diagnosis of type 2 MI because they have an underlying etiology for why they're having this uh, myocardial infarction. They're hypotensive, they're in shock, right? This does not exclude this patient from potentially having a type 1 end STEMI, um, but most likely they're having a supply demand mismatch and they're going to be treated uh, by treating their underlying uh, condition and not undergoing cardiac catheterization. So again, for cardiac cath, the answer would be no. We'll treat this as a type 2 MI. 65-year-old man with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma on chemotherapy. Their platelets are 12 and their hemoglobin is 6.8. They're presenting with exertional substernal chest pain 
They have greater than two millimeter ST elevations in V2 and V3, and they have dynamically rising troponins. So again, remember V2 and V3 are the only two leads where you need a higher threshold to call it an ST elevation. And this person meets that threshold uh, and also has ST elevations in contiguous leads. Uh, they have um, dynamically rising troponins. The fact that you have ST elevations like this, okay, it's automatically STEMI. The problem is, are you gonna cath this person? So the answer for this is actually no. Even though they have STEMI, um, this patient's going to be very high risk if you take them to the cath lab. They have barely any platelets. They're going to be a huge bleeding risk. And even placing them on antiplatelet therapy and everything like that is also going to be a huge place, uh, bleeding risk. So if you place a stent in them, they're not going to tolerate dual antiplatelet therapy. So for this patient, you're probably actually not even going to cath them even though they have a STEMI. You're just going to optimize them as much as you can medically and basically hope for the best. So uh, this is just an example of a patient who has a contraindication to getting a uh, a, cath, a cardiac cath, even though they have a true STEMI. Next is a 70-year-old woman with coronary artery disease, status post PCI, 60-pack year smoking history, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, blah, 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 coming in with shortness of breath and nausea. They have mild new T-wave inversions and elevated troponins, right? So this patient has tons of risk factors, but they're presenting very atypically um, with this just shortness of breath and nausea. But remember, the three populations are elderly uh, patients, women, or patients with diabetes. You have to have a higher index of suspicion for them to present atypically with coronary artery disease or ACS. Uh, the fact that she has this many risk factors and elevated troponins, this is going to be a type 1 end STEMI. And this patient uh, would definitely get a cardiac cath because they are very high risk. Their Timmy Gray score is probably very high. All right, let's do finally some more indications. And these are going to be situations that have actually come up, uh, at least in my experience. And they're going to be a lot of situations where you would not cath somebody. So uh, let's start off with this first one. So 65-year-old homeless man with IV drug use, 50-pack year smoking history, chronic medication non-adherence, who's presenting with exertional substernal chest pain. They have T-wave inversions in anterior leads and dynamically rising troponins. They've got a concerning history, concerning risk factors, and they've got EKG, positive EKG with positive troponins. That's type 1 end STEMI. Are you going to cath this person? The answer is actually going to be no. You're going to go for an ischemia guided management because, again, if you place this person, uh, uh, if you give this person a stent and then they don't follow up, they don't take the dual antiplatelet therapy, they're going to get an instant thrombosis. They're going to have a worse MI and have even worse outcome than you would have if you just had never placed the stent in the first place. Next is a 32-year-old man who came in after a motor vehicle accident, complicated by cardiac arrest, pneumothorax, multiple fractures and amputations, rhabdo, acute blood loss anemia, uh, multiple X-laps, now on pressors, and cardiology was consulted because their components were 215 and now they're 257. Is this person having an ACS event? Very unlikely because this patient's only 32 years old and uh, there's no history here for like risk factors for uh, ACS, uh, but they have multiple reasons to be having uh, uh, type 2 MI, uh, which is a supply demand mismatch, right? So this is going to be a type 2 MI. This patient is not going to get cath. There's no reason to consult cardiology in this situation. So this is going to be a similar patient. Uh, this is going to be a slightly older gentleman who has a motor vehicle accident and all the same uh, complications as the previous patient. But their troponins went up from 215 to 1257. EKG shows ST elevations. So this is going to be a STEMI because they've got ST elevations now. They very well could be having an ACS event. It's an older guy and, uh, you know, the troponin rise is much more concerning and they got ST elevations. Uh, but are you going to cath this guy who's like on pressors and their hemoglobin's dropping and they're like having, you know, they're still having ongoing bleeding? You're also not going to cath this person in this acute setting. Maybe down the line you can try and ca uh, cath them to try and uh, open up some lesions. Uh, but there's no acute intervention uh, for cathing at, at this point. Next is a 45-year-old woman with a motor vehicle accident. Uh, they had some surgeries, and now they have moderate to large bilateral submassive PEs. She's having chest pain. Troponin's 200s on admission, now up to 1600. There's no EKG changes. All right, this is going to be a type 2 MI. They are having a myocardial infarction, but this is from supply-demand mismatch. They're probably slightly hypotensive because they've got these massive PEs. They're putting tons of strain on their heart. Um, so there's a very obvious other reason for why their troponins are so high. In this case, you would also not do cardiac catheterization for this patient. 
Um, I'm going to slightly change it for this next patient. It's the same kind of surgery. It's kind of the same patient, but they have small to moderate submassive PEs. Their troponins were 42 and went to 42. Um, this, in this case, you could probably call it a non-MI troponin elevation because in contrast to the type 2 MI, we're not seeing that dynamic rise in troponins. And so we can't really call this an infarction. This is just some chronic myocardial injury that's happening, um, most likely from the PEs, uh, but we're not seeing evidence of infarction in this case. So again, no catheterization here. Now we have a 67-year-old woman with cirrhosis presenting with an upper GI bleed. Her hemoglobin is 12, hemodynamically stable, so it seems like a pretty minor GI bleed. EKG is normal, troponins 25 to 26. This is again, non-MI troponin elevation, no cardiac cath indicated. And so this is basically the same scenario, uh, but this patient's a little bit more sick. Hemoglobin's eight and hypotensive. EKG has some changes. Troponins have a bit of a more dynamic rise. You're going to call that a type two MI. And again, you're not going to do anything because, uh, you know, this person could have uh, ACS definitely, but uh, they're acutely bleeding. So you're not going to do, you're just going to manage it as a type two MI for now because they have a supply demand mismatch. Um, and again, these last few examples, we're kind of just doing some repetitions of differentiating between non non-MI troponin elevation, and uh, type 2 MI. All right, so that's the conclusion to the resident's guide to acute coronary syndrome. We definitely covered a lot of information. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, please leave them down in the comments below. And again, if I have any corrections, I will put them in the YouTube description as well. And if you enjoyed this content and found it useful, please uh, hit that like and subscribe button so you can get more content like this in the future and really help out my channel. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you so much for watching. Peace.